it's uncomfortable to turn toward our experience because our natural tendency through our conditioning is that anything that's uncomfortable make it go away. And in today's world, we're great at distracting ourselves or taking pills or eating or doing whatever to, to, to make unpleasant things go away. Hi everyone, Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. Today we're talking about all things anxiety, specifically unwinding anxiety. There's a reason why we're seeing so many books on the topic of anxiety and so many episodes on the Broken Brain Podcast, which is there's so many people that are working through this, especially in the context of everything that's happened over the last year. Today's guest is Dr. Judson Brewer, who's the author of the new book, Unwinding Anxiety. New science shows us how to break the cycles of worry and fear to heal our mind. A little bit about Dr. Brewer. He's an internationally renowned addiction psychiatrist and neuroscientist. He's an associate professor in the School of Public Health and Medical School at Brown University. His 2016 TED Talk, A Simple Way to Break a Bad Habit, has been viewed over 16 million times. He's trained Olympic athletes and coaches, government ministers, and even business leaders. His first book, The Craving Mind, From Cigarettes to Smartphones to Love, Why We Get Hooked and How We Break Bad Habits was published in over 16 languages. If you care about the topic of anxiety and unwinding it, stay tuned for this interview. You don't want to miss it. Dr. Brewer, welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. It's an honor to have you here. Thanks for having me. I want to talk about, I'm really big into languaging and I love the intentionality that you bring around languaging because especially for this new book, anxiety can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I want to start off with the title, which is Unwinding Anxiety. So if the title is Unwinding, how is anxiety getting wound up in the first place? <laughs> Yeah, the reason I use this title, and I have to give props to my wife who thought of the, uh, the title, I think it's a great one, Unwinding Anxiety, is about that you can think of the physical feeling of anxiety literally feels like we're wound up, you know, we're closed down, we're contracted. And in fact, that has an evolutionary origin in fear, you know, if we're being chased by the proverbial saber tooth tiger or whatever. Our job is to make ourselves as small an object as possible, right? And protect our vital organs and all this. So we literally close down. Well, you know, in modern day, when there aren't saber tooth tigers, we still close down when we're anxious. And just like you can think of this as a, you know, whatever winds up, you know, a wind up thing that, you know, winding up a spring, whether it's a metronome or a, you know, a, a, to a toy or something like that. What we can do is literally be winding our own anxiety up, perhaps not even knowingly, through old habit loops that are born out of survival. When you think about our modern world, and you know, you you were always pretty well known, and then around last year, I saw you on a ton of podcasts and a lot of media, especially around anxiety and the connection between COVID nineteen and pandemic and everything that we were going through. When you think about our modern world, what are some of these factors that are maybe knowingly or unknowingly instigating that anxiety to be wound up? Yeah. I think the way to think about this is that there are these survival mechanisms. They're called positive and negative reinforcement, basically meaning that they, our brain needs to remember where food is. You know, Imagine if our ancient ancestors are out there foraging on the savannah. They find they can't be laying down memory every moment because they're wasting space, right? It's like they're they're using up their um, their memory card on there, taking pictures of blank things. What they need to do is wait to know when to take the picture, and our brain is set up that way through positive reinforcement. It only takes three elements: a trigger, a behavior, and a result or a reward to do that. So, you know, we're foraging on the savanna. We find a food source. There's a trigger. The behavior is that we eat the food source, and then the reward from a neuroscience perspective is our stomach sends this dopamine signal to our brain that says, remember what you ate and where you found it. So it's like, it takes a snapshot where we lay down a memory, okay? Same thing for running away from the saber-toothed tigers. We don't know where danger is. We see consistently there's danger over here, avoid that danger. So that's positive and negative reinforcement. Now, this process gets perpetuated in modern day. So think of uh, negative reinforcement as fear-based learning, right? You walk out into the busy streets without looking, you step back on the safety of the sidewalk, 
you have this fear response that says, hey, look both ways before crossing your street. Maybe it says, put away your phone or whatever it was that led us not to be looking in the first place. What that That's the old survival part of our brain layered on top of it is the newer part of our brain that also helps us survive, but in a different way through thinking and planning. Okay, so this is the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex needs a couple of things to think and plan. It needs precedent. So it needs to have seen things happen or heard about things or read about things. And it also needs accurate information. So it can take past experience and project it or predict the future from it. The less accurate the information we have, the more uncertainty is there. And that uncertainty drives our brain to say, go get information. When there isn't information, that can spiral out into worry and anxiety, where, you know, think of anxiety as this feeling of nervousness or unease about something with an uncertain outcome. So it's this old survival mechanism that's saying, go get information. But we interpret that as, oh, you know, oh no. And we start worrying about every worst case scenario that might come up. So that's how this, survival brain plus plus this newer part of the brain that's helping us think and plan you know kind of goes off the rails it's think of it as fear is helpful for survival fear plus uncertainty leads to anxiety which is not as helpful so before we go a little further i always like to give a little bit of the hero's journey to set the stage for um, the conversation you know you had a pretty profound experience early on in sort of your medical training Mm-hmm. Um, before we go into that though, I've heard you on different podcasts and interviews talk about how being in university at, I believe Princeton, were you at Princeton was a very profound time for you. It sounded like there was a lot of experimentation that was going on, maybe some dietary stuff, also some, some mindfulness. What, what was going on in university that you started to look to maybe different sources of information to change your lifestyle around? Yeah. At the end of my senior year, you know, I had started having some GI issues, which, you know, I won't go into all the details, but let's just say they weren't pleasant or pretty. <laughs> and, senior year of you, of uh, high school or of college of college. college. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, and, and I went to the, I went to the doctor at the university health services and I'd done a lot of backpacking in college. It was something that I found very refreshing uh, it even it life giving. You know, I love being in the outdoors. I love being physical, and I thought you know maybe I had Giardia, which is this uh, bacterial you know infection, this amoebic infection uh, that can lead to you know some pretty distressing GI symptoms. And the doctor said, "Oh, you know, could you be stressed?" And I said, "No, I can't be stressed. You know, I play the violin, I run, and you know, I do all these things. I eat healthy, all this stuff." And what I hadn't realized was that there's this really strong mind-body connection in my, my mind was influencing my body, uh, leading to some pretty big, you know, GI blowouts, basically, that turned out to be irritable bowel syndrome. And I didn't know it because I hadn't really paid attention to that connection before. There's this great, there's a line in one of the short stories from James Joyce's Dubliners, uh, where it says something like, Mr. Duffy lives a short distance from his body. You know, and so it was kind of like I was I was taking the mind track and thinking that that's, you know, that's how to live life. But I wasn't actually paying attention to my body and what my body was telling me. And so that prompted me to actually start uh, that in a, in a uh, stressful relationship breakup right after college. And, you know, the beginning of medical school, I was, you know, I was pretty stressed out. And I started meditating my first day of medical school which you know, I can look back and say what was a way to help me really understand this mind-body connection, understand how my mind worked, because I didn't know how my own mind worked to the point where you know, I thought I had some infection when in fact it was my mind doing all of that. Super interesting, because just as you're talking about you know, mind-body medicine, I'm not sure what year that was that you were in uh, university in your senior year, but probably around that time, mind-body medicine was getting a little bit more traction, nothing like what it is today. Mm -hmm. And since that time period, there's also been, and this is what a lot of our podcast is about, is body-mind medicine, that the body and that our gut bacteria and the type of bacteria that we have or sometimes don't have can influence things like our mental health, can make us more likely for anxiety. So it's interesting. I didn't know that you went through the GI issues 
but I think that a lot of people have experienced both sides of it where their brain is impacting the body, but also where their body is impacting the brain. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's a, it's a reciprocal relationship for sure. And I think that's, you know, we hardly know much about the brain. And then there's this whole other brain in our gut that we know even less about as scientists. Uh, it's so true. Well, going from there, you know, you were very lucky that you were practicing and sort of open to meditation. Sounds like you were also changing your diet. I heard you on another podcast where you talked about uh, maybe adopting more of a plant-based diet back then. Um, and you were doing a lot of experimentation. And that took you to this sort of very crucial moment where you had your own experiences with sort of anxiety and, and panic attacks. Can you set the stage for us and tell a story uh, of that time period? I'd be happy to. So as I went through my MD PhD years, I just started practicing meditation myself, really got into it, started going, you know, meditated every day, started going on silent retreats, you know, weeks at a time. And I will say, I'll preface this by saying my first meditation retreat by day three, I was crying uncontrollably on the shoulder of the retreat manager because I felt like I was a total failure. You know, I could get through Princeton, I could get into medical school, but I couldn't pay attention to my breath. So just for anybody out there that struggled on a silent meditation retreat, you are not alone and it is normal. And there's actually, we can talk about how to, how to work with that because I hadn't realized what I was doing quote unquote wrong. I was taking the willpower approach basically to the meditation and, it, and it's not about willpower. So when I started residency and it was probably in my second year of residency, I, so about 10 years after I had started meditating, I started getting full-blown panic attacks. And I remember waking up from the middle of, you know, from a dead sleep with a full-blown panic attack. And I, because I was in residency, I was, you know, as a psychiatrist, I was studying this and I would just go down the checklist, like, oh, shortness of, shortness of breath, check. You know, feeling like I'm going to die, check. Uh, racing heart, check. You know, sweating, check. And I would go through that whole checklist and then my mindfulness practice would kick in and it would note. So one of the keys of mindfulness is it's not about changing things. It's not about changing our thoughts or changing our emotions or changing our body sensations, but it's about changing our relationship to those things. And one practice I was doing at the time was called noting practice, where I could just simply note, oh, here's a thought. Oh, here's an emotion. Here's a body sensation. And the way that that works is it's like the observer effect in physics where, you know, when they were measuring, they would use uh, photons, you know, light to measure electrons and the photon would actually affect the velocity of the, of the electron. So they call it the observer effect that by observing the electron, they were actually affecting their result and they couldn't get a, a clean result. They had to account for that. Well, the same thing is true in psychology. You can think of there's this Hawthorne effect where the expectation of somebody in a, in a lab study is going to affect their results. But it's also true on a very personal individual level, one moment at a time. We can either be identified with our thoughts and emotions, or we can be noticing them <clears throat> and observing them. That's what mindfulness is about. And so this noting practice helps people observe thoughts and emotions. By observing, we are, can no longer be as identified with them as we were previously. So when I would have this panic attack, I could note, you know, feeling of impending doom. And I could, and by observing it and noting it, I wasn't as attached to it or identified with it. And literally, I could, you know, note the panic attack. And then probably helped along by sleep deprivation of residency, I could go right back to sleep. Now, one thing I'll highlight with panic attacks, these are these turn into panic disorder when we start to basically panic that we're going to have future panic attacks. Okay. So think of this negative reinforcement thing. You know, I have a thought, oh no, I might get in a panic, I might have a panic attack. The behavior is to start to worry that whatever I did, you know, like uh, whatever I do might lead to panic. And then I avoid doing that behavior. So this can get reinforced. And then we start avoiding things. I, I can give a, uh, an example of that in a minute, if it's helpful. But for me, I was able to step out of that and not actually step into that cycle of worrying that I was going to worry or worrying that I was going to panic because I could see these things as thoughts, sensations, you know, uh, emotions and, and, things like that and not get caught up in them. Now, again, this was after about 10 years of mindfulness practice, but for me, that was really critical to see this proof of concept with this N of one experiment 
where you know the panic is full full on anxiety where leading to wildly unthinking behavior i think is the definition of panic if if we can use awareness to work with that that's a pretty powerful tool and, and is worth exploring more so this was in residency i kind of noted noted that for future but didn't actually start researching anxiety for years after that you know you talk about at that time being in your residency that there was sort of like an unspoken code that students had to be tough, almost like yeah. super human. And so if you were feeling sensations, the idea of not just you, but your colleagues and having a lot of family members that are doctors, knowing that that's still trend that has kind of continued today, that sort of uh, that unspoken rule. Um, and you say that that meant if you felt tired or hungry, you couldn't even admit it and that you needed to go, that you even needed to go to the bathroom. It was hard to even like speak up and say that. How did those pressures um, add to the the feelings that you were having at the time? Yeah, so there, I like this term armor up. I don't know if you've heard that, where we basically had to armor up, you know? <laughs> which means shove anything down that's going to get in the way of us being those martyrs taking care of our patients because our patients were the top priority. Of course, they are, but... If, this was at the detriment of our own health. And of course, I didn't see at the time, the best way for me to be able to take care of my patients is to be healthy myself, grounded both physically and emotionally. And so the idea is just shove everything down and worry about it when you die, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and that's almost like a badge of honor. You know, that's yeah. proving that you were worthy enough, which is super interesting because, you know, I, I sort of feel like in America, at least or in the Western world, we you know, doctors are incredible and they just provide so much infrastructure around just what we know as modern healthcare. And I think as a society, we expect a lot from them. Um, and we want all the answers from, you know, the doctors that are in the world that are taking care of us. But we have to also recognize that often the system is designed in a way that even their own health is pushed aside, which is why we sometimes see some higher rates of prescription Drug, ab drug abuse amongst doctors and physicians in the general population is that they're just human beings too that are trying to survive and do their best. And they're working in a very challenging situation and scenario. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're seeing, you know, we're seeing lots of epidemics. We have, we have a, you know, pandemic, but we also have an opioid epidemic. We've got an obesity epidemic. And in fact, there's a, there's a burnout epidemic amongst healthcare workers, not just physicians. They're, they're, you know, part of it, but lots of healthcare workers where, you know, everybody's playing, playing this martyr role because it was kind of expected and cultural. And it's, it's leading to, you know, to a lot of folks uh, leaving their practices, uh, not help, not being able to help their patients, and then just being ill themselves, not being able to be there for their patients when they wish they could be. I want to pivot from anxiety to a sister topic that you've talked about for quite some time now, which is addiction. And there is an interplay and they are connected in some ways. And we'll come back to that uh, connection that's there. But one of the things that you like to talk about is that we all are addicted to something. At what point in time in your career did your awareness around addiction being so much bigger than alcoholism or, uh, you know, a traditional drug usage, at what point in time did that idea come into your world? It was probably sometime after either in or after residency. I remember one of my professors, uh, his name is Mark Potenza at Yale. He was, he was a, he gave me this simple definition of addiction, which was continued use despite adverse consequences. And this just rang so true to me where, you know, we can talk about all the substances and that's a lot of what I was training to work with. But it really was way beyond that, where, you know, we can uh, continue eating despite adverse consequences when somebody is binge eating, for example, or just overeating and leading to obesity, continued internet use, you know, continued social media use, especially now we can see this all over the place. But even back, you know, 10 years ago, I could start to see the seeds of that. And I could even look back in my own life. And I remember... I had this addiction to running basically or, or exercise where I needed to get out and run every day, or I would have, you know, I would, I would be irritable. I would be, you know, I'd meet all these criteria where basically I was dependent on this, this feeling of running and of being in shape and whatnot. 
where even that um, could lead to you know detrimental consequences. Where you know if I got injured, it would be it would be problematic. So yeah, it was it was over a decade ago, but I think that is so much easier to see today. And even in the research literature, folks are starting to acknowledge behavioral addictions. I think internet addiction was the first recognized one, but I think there are going to be you know more flavors of that to come. Having had this history of panic attacks, what did you notice as being some of the ways that anxiety and addictions, again, going beyond just traditional addictions that we all know, what were some of the ways that you saw that these things were maybe connected? You know, that actually came serendipitously. If you look at the addiction and the anxiety piece, and this came out of two things, I think. One was my own suffering where I was struggling helping my patients with anxiety. So if you look at the uh, the research literature around how well the gold standard medication works for anxiety. So there's this class of antidepressants that's used for anxiety. And the um, there's this thing called the number needed to treat. So you need to treat X number of people before one person benefits or has, shows a significant reduction in symptoms. The number needed to treat for, for the gold standard class of medications for anxiety is 5.15. So you can imagine me in my clinic, you know, giving my every patient that comes in with anxiety and medication, and only one of those really showing a significant benefit from that. That's not a very good hit rate. You know? <laughs> 20% of my day is satisfying because my patient comes back and says, thank you, that was helpful. And the others are like, what else you got, doc? This sucked, you know, this didn't work. So that was one piece. And another piece was that my lab was, as I, as we had mentioned, my lab was studying addictions, you know, as an addiction psychiatrist, I wanted to find better treatments for addictions. So we had started studying mindfulness training as a way to help people with habits and addictions. And we had developed this, this app for eating called Eat Right Now. And the uh, study was ongoing. This was led by Ashley Mason at UCSF, where Eventually, we found that uh, a 40% reduction in craving-related eating when somebody um, used mindfulness training. And so we were seeing, wow, there's some, some nice effect here. Somebody from that program said, hey, I'm, I'm realizing that my trigger behavior result goes like this. I'm anxious, so I stress eat, and that, you know, that distracts me from eating. And then she said, can you make a program for anxiety? And I was thinking, well... I usually give people medications for anxiety. What am I going to do? And so I started looking back at the literature and this, this is where I had this aha moment. So back in the eighties, when the, the, the stones were singing about uh, mother's little helper, you know, benzodiazepines, she goes running to the shelter of her mother's little helper and it helps her through her day, you know, or, or however the lyrics go. So they were singing about benzos, which now are, you know, not recommended as a treatment for anxiety for all sorts of reasons. They uh, Prozac was just in, uh, discovered or invented, you know, and people were all looking at the miracle of Prozac and they were overlooking this guy, Thomas Borkovic, who was a researcher at Penn State. He was studying anxiety and in particular worry. And what he proposed was that anxiety could be driven in the same way as any negatively reinforced habit. And that just blew my mind. Because I was, I was like, oh, I'm a habit guy. You know, I'm a habit researcher. I'm a habit addiction psychiatrist. Can we actually bring these things to, together? And the way it works is anxiety triggers worry, which then gives people a feeling of control or distracts from, distracts from that worst feeling, feeling of anxiety. Um, and so we developed this, you know, we developed this app called Unring Anxiety and started testing it clinically to see if it would actually work. Because as a, as a physician, I wouldn't feel comfortable just recommending some app to somebody unless I knew it worked. And as a researcher, I wanted to know if this was true. You know, was, was Borkebeck barking up <laughs> the wrong tree or the right tree? So we, we really approached this. Uh, long story short, we did a couple of studies, one with anxious physicians, okay, 57% reduction in clinically validated anxiety scores. And we got significant reductions in burnout, in these folks, even though we didn't mention the word burnout at all, because there was a very strong correlation between anxiety and burnout. So we replicated this with a larger randomized control trial of people with generalized anxiety disorder. Long story short, 67% reduction in these clinically validated anxiety scores. And importantly, we could calculate that number needed to treat. So remember for medications, that number needed to treat is 1 point, is 5.15. Uh, for our study, it was 1.6. 
So That's huge. That was that was great. And so if a drug really, could do that, it'd be the next billion dollar drug. Yes. Well said. <laughs> so for the folks that are listening that are not familiar with your work, I think it's I think it's good to go into a little bit of the framework of what you were doing with these people. And you kind of hinted at it earlier, which is really from your early exposure to mindfulness and, and meditation techniques, there was this curiosity around awareness and how awareness can be this tool that I often think of anxiety as pulling us into the past or the future. It's taking us out of the present moment. And when we can step back in through some vehicle, and these are the vehicles you've been giving people for all sorts of different stuff, including quitting smoking, um, something magical happens. So what did you actually have people do? And could you use one of the examples that you've uh, maybe from uh, one of the past uh, stories that you told about a group of people who were addicted to smoking and you kind of took them through a process to help them lessen their reliance on cigarettes. Yeah. I'll give an example of smoking. And then if it's helpful, I can give an example of somebody using this for anxiety or worry. Cause I think totally. we're seeing a lot of that these days. It's anxiety is the new smoking. <laughs> the, so with smoking, and this goes way back to some of one of the first studies that I did uh, when I started my lab was, you know, the hypothesis was that, well, this goes actually back to the ancient Buddhist psychology. So, you know, looking at the, the canonical teachings of the Buddha, you know, this is, we're trying to follow the history, like what, what are these psychological mechanisms? There was this phrase that caught my mind that was really interesting, which was something like, it wasn't until I explored gratification to its end that knowledge and vision arose. Okay. And so this is the Buddha speaking and talking about how he got enlightened. And that was, you know, I puzzled on that for a long time. And then I realized, huh, he might be talking about positive and negative reinforcement here because a behavior, you don't change a behavior just by telling yourself to stop the behavior, you know? All my patients would be like, well, I would just tell myself to quit smoking and then they would stop. They wouldn't need to see me. So it's not the behavior itself that drives future behavior. It's how rewarding that behavior is. That's why reinforcement learning is called reward-based learning. So if smoking is rewarding, somebody's going to keep doing it. Okay. So this exploring gratification to its end was really interesting because People, and this goes into the neuroscience of how we lay down, you know, how we decide, make decisions and how we lay down habits. Basically, we have this reward hierarchy set up for all these, all different behaviors. So for example, if we're given the choice between eating a piece of broccoli and a piece of cake, our brain's going to say, eat the cake. Because we've laid down this reward value ever since childhood, where it's, you know, every birthday party, you know, is associated with friends and parties and you know, ice cream and presents and all this stuff. And we reinforce this behavior that, or this reward value that cake is so rewarding. And as compared to broccoli, they don't generally serve broccoli at birthday parties, you know? So we have this reward hierarchy set up so that when our brain sees the thing, it says, oh yeah, it's that rewarding, do it again. And it will keep doing that unless we pay attention, unless we see very, very clearly that that behavior is not that rewarding. So most people start smoking around the age of 13. In the study that we did, it was the average age of onset for smoking was 13 years of age. And these folks were generally in their you know, middle age and they're trying to quit smoking. So they'd reinforce this behavior a long time. They weren't actually paying attention as they were smoking. So what we had people do in the study was to literally pay attention when they smoked, okay? And what they realized... I've, I have tons of examples of this with my clinic patients as well as these studies where they, there's this one guy, he's like, taking his, he looks at his cigarette and he, you know, he's like, looks puzzled. And he's like, how the heck did I not notice this before? This is a guy that had been smoking for 30 years. He'd smoked an average of like 200. He was smoking. We calculated like 293,000 cigarettes he'd smoked. So he'd reinforced this that many times. He hadn't realized that smoking tastes like crap. Because he had associated the reward value with being young and cool at school or rebelling or whatever it was that got him addicted. And then he would smoke because he would get this withdrawal and then that would feel bad. So he'd try to make that bad feeling go away. So we have people just pay attention as they do the behavior. Smoking is a great example because cigarettes don't taste good. And as people really pay attention, they start to become disenchanted. Just like the Buddha quote unquote said, 
exploring gratification to its end. So we ask them, really pay attention. What do you get from this? This can even be done. So smoking is pretty, pretty straightforward in terms of seeing the reward value because it just doesn't taste good. Eating is a little more subtle. So we could even talk about that. If what There's this pleasure plateau that happens with eating. You know, too much of a good thing is true. So let's say somebody eats a piece of pizza. They eat a piece of pizza, tastes great, especially if they're hungry. You know, they eat a second piece of pizza. And what I have people do is I say, pay attention with each bite and ask yourself, is this more pleasurable just as or less pleasurable than the last bite? So they can actually find that pleasure plateau where they've, you know, they're not hungry anymore. The pizza is, you know, it's, it, they've, they've got, you know, they've gotten that pleasure from the taste. And then they start to go off the other end if, where they're just habitually eating, where they're stuffing themselves and it doesn't feel very good. So they can, everybody's got this pleasure plateau, no matter how good a food is, you know, you can get to, you know, you can't just keep eating it. And I actually wrote a chapter in my book about uh, one of my friends, Dana Small, who did a chocolate experiment where she just kept feeding people chocolate, you know, and, and, and measured this. So whether it's smoking or eating, we can actually find where that reward value not only stops increasing, but plateaus and goes down. And this is called a negative prediction error in, in the science of this, there's, you know, this whole setup based on these two researchers with Scorla and Wagner from the seventies, where they have this whole reward value system. And they say, if you don't pay attention, that behavior is going to continue because it's, you haven't changed the reward value. If you pay attention and it's not rewarding. So the cigarettes taste like crap or eating too much is, doesn't feel good or realizing that worrying doesn't actually do much. That negative prediction error helps us see that gratification as, oh, it's not very gratifying. And we start to become disenchanted with that behavior. Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense. You know, and it brings up when we look at it through like the world in the lens of uh, evolutionary development as human beings. And, and prior to that, of, um, you know, all the different origins that we came from, we were never really around a concentration of calories in the way that we have now. So these concentration of calories that we're able to come by cake and other things like that, maybe depending on, you know, what research you go into, we had honey at the most, right? And you can see that from modern day hunter gatherer societies. So we're now in a place where we have an abundance of calories, more people dying from diseases of obesity and sort of overfeeding and chronic diseases that are linked to that compared to our history of starvation uh, as a human race. And, you know, our mind, you talk about the different parts of the brain, you know, and our part of our brain, I guess it would be our limbic brain that is just focused on meeting the next sort of immediate bodily need mm -hmm. of calories or reproduction or whatever it might mean. Uh, it's, it takes over. And do you see it as like when you are sitting with a group, and they're becoming more aware, they're stepping into their awareness and their awareness like literally growing like a balloon. Do you see it as their attention in their brain is going kind of from one portion to another portion that helps them see the situation for what it is? Like, how do you look at where this is living in the brain and in the body? That's a great question. So from a, from a behavioral or embodied perspective, this reward-based learning system is pretty clear in terms of, you know, if something's more rewarding than something else, we're going to do the thing that is more rewarding. There are, you know, a lot of reward systems in the brain that help set up how rewarding, you know, or help us lay down memory for, oh yeah, that was rewarding, more rewarding than this. And this is the dopaminergic system, like the mesolimbic cortical system. So this, this system, you know, fires dopamine, basically uh, these neurons project from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens, details aren't important, but basically we get this dopamine spritz every time we get a, a something big, you know, big reward and calories, you know, like something that's very sweet tends to send off a dopamine signal in the brain. There was a study uh, in the boy about 10 years ago showing that they, this is a study in rats with I think it was Oreos <laughs> or something like that, that something very sugar laden where they found that they could get as much of a dopamine surge in with feeding these rats, the sugar that as they could with cocaine, you know, so, which is known to block the dopamine transporter and, and cause an increase in dopamine in the, in the synapse. So there are these reward centers that get activated, but those are set up to help us remember things like, Oh, Oreo, eat that again. 
And those that that firing stops happening once we become habituated to it. So we're like, oh yeah, I know Oreos taste good. But interestingly, that firing starts happening in anticipation of consumption. It basically fires to urge us off the couch to go get the Oreos. Basically, the craving. Oh, we think we have a thought that says, oh yeah, Oreos, I want some Oreos. We have this urge to go get it. And that's associated with the dopamine firing. So it's interesting that it helps us lay down the memory that says this is rewarding. And then it also is set up to say, go get it in the future, okay? So that's one brain system that's involved here. The other is this, this uh, my lab has been studying this default mode network a lot, which has a lot to do. So it gets activated when people are craving all sorts of things, whether it's chocolate or cigarettes or uh, gambling, cocaine, you know, all uh, these have all been shown to activate you know, when people are shown cues of these uh, these objects, it activates this this default mode network. Interestingly, this default mode network is associated with self reference. Basically, when something is relating to us, and my lab's done a bunch of work showing that 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 specific aspect of the us is when we get caught up in our experience. So it's not just having the craving; it's about getting caught up in the craving. Like, oh yeah, I really want that as compared to, oh, there's a craving. Can you see that that's a subtle difference? So I want to make sure that's clear. If for anybody, you know, really thinking about this, it's about that feeling of contraction that says, you know, go do that, right? Go get that. And that feeling of contraction has an overlap with some very interesting emotional things as well. So we can get caught up in regretting things in the past. Called, you know, rumination when with depression, this happens a lot where we're ruminating. Oh, you know, I can't believe that happened or whatever. We get caught up in that experience. This also happens when we worry about the future. We get caught up in anxiety. These have both also been shown to activate this default mode network. Interestingly, serendipitously, my lab, when we were studying experienced meditators and scanning their brains, we found that the default mode network gets really quiet in experienced meditators compared to novices. And in fact, we did another study with people who are trying to quit smoking. And we found that people who got our smoking app versus the National Cancer Institute's app, uh, that we could scan their brains before and after they got the training. And we found that there was a decreased activity in this default one network and that that predicted uh, whether they cut down on cigarettes or not, but only in our mindfulness group, not in the, the standard cognitive behavioral a strategy that was given by the National Cancer Institute's app. So that network seems to be involved as well and seems mostly related to this, this aspect of getting caught up in our experience. And I think that's really one of the quintessential features of anxiety is that feeling of contraction or closed down of caught upness. It's, it's just another reminder that the mindfulness-based approach, which you have a whole methodology, and I believe that there's an app out right now still that that you recommend that people can go through that is available to the public. Is that correct? Yes. We have an unwinding anxiety app. Yes. Unwinding anxiety app. And it's like that mindfulness practice is really the space between, are you going to play out old habits or can you see the situation for what it is in this present moment? Mm-hmm. Yep. It's that's the, it in a nutshell. It's, it's the, it's the most straightforward thing, but for many people, it's the toughest thing in the world is there's always the question of how do you actually grow awareness? And because it is challenging, it's actually very helpful to be guided into that if you have not established that yet. Just having a prompt, an apt, an individual walk you through that because sometimes people think like, especially when they first get into some of these Western philosophies or they're first learning about awareness, they think either you have it or you don't. But I feel like people like yourself, researchers like yourself are like, that's a fallacy. You can grow it inside of it. It just takes a little bit of practice and you can grow it and it can help you in all aspects of your life. Yeah, absolutely. We all have awareness. And I'll, I'll just highlight one thing that you said, which is it's uncomfortable to turn toward our experience because our natural tendency through our conditioning is that anything that's uncomfortable, make it go away. And in today's world, we're great at distracting ourselves or taking pills or eating or doing whatever to, to, to make unpleasant things go away. So we've actually, as a society, probably lost our ability to tolerate distress, you know, our collective distress tolerance has gone down. So of course, it's going to seem foreign for somebody to suggest, oh, instead of moving away or making this feel better temporarily, 
your job is to lean in rather than lean away. It can, that can seem kind of strange. So I just want to highlight that, that in the end, you know, it might seem strange at first. It might seem uncomfortable at first, but you know, there's this saying, what is it? The only way out is through, <laughs> you know, and the only way we're going to get out of this predicament of trying to avoid unpleasant things, which we can't do is through our own experience, leaning in and saying, oh, my relationship with this can change. And, you know, I can actually be with uncomfortable things and it's not that bad. It's a, it's a complete mindset, mindset shift when you step into it. But sometimes like a lot of things, it seems so obvious that we overlook it and we jump to the next thing. And that's why it's the toughest and it's the easiest, but it's the toughest thing in the world. Um, I know this isn't your particular area of study, but I know because you are into the world of health and wellness, I'd love to get your opinions on it. There is quite a decent amount of practitioners that are in our world of, let's call it functional medicine, uh, all get about getting to the root cause of why you know, disease happens, that feel that there's a strong link between um, blood sugar imbalances and anxiety, specifically that we are eating a diet that's so rich in certain types of often carbohydrates, processed carbohydrates that are constantly shooting our blood sugar up. And then we end up crashing. And when we crash on the bottom end of it, you know, and for anybody who wears like a continuous glucose monitor, you can see that, you know, uh, a lot of my community does. I have my mine on right here as well, that when you crash your body, which was evolutionarily crashing your blood sugar was not as like not something that happened often, right? Mm-hmm. We had access to food and the types of foods that we're eating typically would let our blood sugar stabilize over longer periods of time. We didn't have, going back to our earlier conversation, the concentrated calories that would put us on this roller coaster ride. But when we do crash, our body freaks out and is like, holy shit, I'm going to die. And everything can become, become heightened. So if your partner, who you know is loving and you care about, gives you some constructive feedback, you might snap at them and be, you know, as my friend Dave Asprey calls it, hypoglybitchy to, towards them. Or, or somebody says something, you could be more a little sensitive, or you're thinking about this last call or email that your boss sent you, and everything becomes heightened because you are in this state where the body is driving you on purpose to be more anxious to solve this energy crash. Yeah. Again, I know it's not your exact world, but I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about it uh, since we've talked about it quite a bit on the podcast previously, even if you completely disagree. And by the way, feel free to be honest about any thoughts that you have. Yeah. Well, this this is one that I agree with. And I think one aspect to focus on here is this, uh, this idea of somatic memory. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but yeah, I, I, not surprising that you are. Systematic memory is basically where we learn to associate bodily sensations with emotions and body postures even with emotions. So for example, if somebody clenches, I'm doing this right now, if they clench their shoulders, it tends to not make them feel more relaxed because we're associating, we tend to associate clenching, you know, especially if our shoulders or our jaw with feeling stressed out or anxious. And the same thing is true. I think the same thing can happen where we can start to, you know, our body is basically going into survival mode saying, go get calories when we're hypoglycemic. And those, that rush of, you know, you know, irritability, shortness, all these things that are basically saying, go get the calories, start to get associated with, uh, you know, with how we interact with others in the world, when in fact, we should just be focusing on getting the calories as compared to having an in-depth conversation with our romantic partner or whatever, you know, that's not the time to be getting constructive feedback from somebody on our, you know, the latest novel that we wrote or whatever, because our body's saying, dude, I need food (laughs) as compared to, Hey, you know, let's have a, let's have a good conversation. So we can, we can automatically kind of kick into that, you know, that mode of, you know, where our, our hormones are jacked and all these things that are just trying to get us off the couch and into the kitchen to, to fix that temporary problem. Yet the more we do that, the more, the more we can just start to have those somatic um, feelings and then lay down those somatic memories where any time that we just have a low glycemic, you know, our, our, our blood sugar goes a little bit low, 
that can trigger us to say, oh, you should be anxious right now, you know, uh, and things like that. So that's that's one thing I would add there. In addition to, I, I generally agree w- with what you're talking about how how all of this can this can kind of get lumped together. Yeah, we can think about the body mind component of it, but we still need the awareness if we're going to solidify how we want to respond to this moving forward in the future. Yeah, absolutely, because it's important to know what the problem is, right? So. If the problem is that we have low blood sugar, it's important to get food. If the problem is that we're sleep deprived, it's important to get sleep. We can't power through these things as much as our thinking brains love to think that they can, you know, they can think us out of these situations. You can't think yourself into, into getting your stomach some calories. It's so true. And it's also the connection between the gut and the brain, which is sometimes we just have a feeling that doesn't have words attached to it yet. It's more of a sensation that I just feel uneasy right now. Okay, let me bring some awareness to that. Where, where's the pain? You know, what? Let me prompt myself with some questions like, why do I feel uneasy? It's actually human beings are pretty bad at knowing why they feel how they feel, it seems to be. And it takes a little bit of instructions since we didn't, weren't born with a manual um, to be able to decipher and actually not subvert it. Um, I'm going to talk about last year, which was, you know, a really challenging year for a lot of people. And uh, I saw you in a lot of different media outlets being called upon to talk about anxiety in the context of uh, a global pandemic. Mm-hmm. When you look back on last year and the people, friends, patients, uh, individuals that you're just in touch with, with all the uncertainty that took place, who typically was able to thrive and be resilient and what were they doing and who really had a hard time? Well, I would say, and it's hard to generalize, but I think there are some characteristics that I saw. One is, this actually goes back to something you just said earlier, which is the folks that were actually aware of their bodies. So, you know, our thinking, I think of it as our thinking brains don't hold a candle to our feeling bodies. And so, you know, people can be, you caught in their heads and lost in their heads all the time, trying to, you know, trying to think them way, think themselves into calmness, for example, which of course doesn't work. But what I saw was that people that were able to kind of feel into their bodies and feel, okay, what's, what's happening right now? What's driving me? What do I need right now? Cause often, you know, as people are reshuffling their daily schedules and just, you know, with all this uncertainty, not, you know, being not working in their workplaces, all of these things were different. People were starting to form new habits around their, their everyday lives. And so, you know, they might not be eating at the times that they normally would eat, or they might not be exercising. They might, you know, there, a lot of things were changing and they might not, for, for folks that were not aware of what their body's needs were, they were, you know, they're more likely to get reactive, for example, like you were talking about earlier. Whereas folks that could really pay attention to what was happening, they could ask themselves simple questions like, what do I need right now? And at the same time, they could, I was seeing an, another piece here where there was a lot of social contagion happening. And I think this still happens you know, with social media, this idea of social contagion being the spread of emotion from one person to another. This can happen, you know, you, you can't wear a face mask for that. <laughs> you know, that doesn't, that doesn't protect us. It's really about if we're on social media looking for news, which a lot of people do, we got to scroll through a bunch of uh, fear, um, you know, outrage, vitriol, you know, all this stuff, which we could then catch. It's like, you know, every, every scroll is like somebody sneezing on our brain. We're more likely to catch that social, uh, social contagion. So whether folks kind of regulated their social media use, which is hard to use willpower to do, but they were fine, you know, if they're like, wow, this isn't helping me, I'm not going to use it that much, or just simply going on and using it uh, judiciously and not getting caught up in it, again, back to their awareness, noticing, oh, you know, is this, is this riling me up, time to put it down, or, you know, could they use it where they're just scrolling through and being curious about what's happening and not getting caught up in it? Those folks were also, um, and I think still tend to flourish more than folks that are kind of disembodied. I'd love if you could walk us through in the book, you have your mind mapping exercise. Yeah. And if you could explain what it is and, and walk us through it here on the podcast, I think people would get a lot of value from that. I'd be happy to. So the, the book is actually set up in three main segments. I like think of it as like step one, step two, step three. 
So step one is about mapping our minds. If we don't know how our minds work, we can't work with our minds. That's the bottom line, you know, full stop. If we can't, if we don't know how our minds work, we can't work with them. So the idea is to start simply by mapping our minds out. Maybe I can give an example of one of my patients actually that would highlight this. Um, so I'll use that. So a patient, this is about uh, two years ago, a patient was referred to me for anxiety. And he, he, he walked in my office and I could see that he was anxious, you know, so was, that part was pretty straightforward. But when I started taking his history, I asked him, you know, well, what's causing the anxiety? And he started talking about getting panic attacks. And I pulled out at that point, I pulled out a piece of paper and I said, okay, this is how habits are formed, you know, trigger behavior and a, and a reward or a result. Can we just map out any of your habit loops around you know, panic and anxiety? And what he was able to do very quickly, he said, okay, when I get in the car, when I'm on the highway in my car, I feel like I'm in a speeding bullet. There's that trigger is that, is that thought the behavior was to at the beginning was to avoid, you know, to get off the highway because, because he would have a panic attack and then eventually just avoid driving on the highway altogether. There was the behavior. Okay. Avoiding driving so that, and the reward would be, he could avoid those negative thoughts. So what I had him do, I actually gave him our unwinding anxiety app, but I said, hey, map out these habit loops for the next two weeks. Just see what habit loops you have, okay? What's the trigger, what's the behavior, and what's the reward or the result, okay? So he came back two weeks later, and the first thing he said to me was, oh, doc, I lost 14 pounds. <laughs> now, I forgot to mention this guy was 180 pounds overweight. <laughs> so, And I looked at him kind of, quizzically, because I was trying to think, did we even talk about weight loss at our first visit? I don't think so. And he said, no, I was mapping out my habit loops. And I realized that anxiety was triggering me to stress eat and that that stress eating was not helping. So this goes back to the disenchantment. So he said, I stopped doing it. He went on to lose over a hundred pounds. Okay. So there's the habit mapping, whether it's worry, anxiety, procrastination, stress eating, smoking, internet use, buying shoes, whatever. Anybody can map out their habit loop. What's the trigger? What's the behavior? And what's the reward or the result? Okay. So we, you know, we have people just download a, a habit, you know, they can, or somebody can write it on a piece of paper. Or they can download it from my website uh, and just start mapping out their habit loops. And it's amazing how many habit loops people can map out in a single day. So now once you're aware of the loop, because you get the trigger behavior and result and the interplay between those, then is the next step to, for example, if somebody wanted to use your app or go through that process, is that the next step? And, and when do you bring in that next step when you are starting to notice anxiety come on? Or is it something that you practice just on a daily basis, whether you have anxiety or not? Yeah, I think it's always helpful to practice these things on a daily basis, you know, to start any new habit. So if you think of somebody wanting to start the habit of being aware, you know, short moments, many times of whatever the behavior is, is going to help, you know, perpetuate or drive or solidify that behavior. So the more people can practice just being aware or mapping these things out throughout the, throughout the day is, is better. And it's, I'd say, especially if somebody's trying to work with habit loops around anxiety or worry, certainly helpful to start when things aren't, you know, at, at full blown at mock at uh, DEF CON five you know, for, <laughs> for their anxiety or their worry. But the next step there is really, a sim I have people ask a simple question and I detail how all of this works uh, from a neuroscience perspective in my book, but you know, ask themselves this simple question, what am I getting from this, right? And so that gets back at the reward value of you know, if they're worrying, is it actually solving the problem, helping get something done or whatever? You know, there's this whole misnomer about performance anxiety that goes back to a study of Japanese dancing mice in 1908 that became this, this folklore that, you know, we must be anxious to perform well. So some people might think that that's the only way they can get things done. Well, in fact, anxiety makes the thinking and planning part of our brain go offline. So it doesn't help us perform. There, there's actually an inverse relationship between anxiety and performance. So even that we can explore, like, is this actually helping me? What am I getting from this? You know, when I, when I worry about this for the 87th time, that helps us become disenchanted with the old behavior, whether it's worry or overeating or anything. So that's really that second step. 
I think that's such a powerful question and a question that people don't always entertain because sometimes it feels like anxiety is just this outward force that's happening to us. Mm -hmm. And the challenge with that is that while many people have gone through big T traumas and little T traumas, and that can exacerbate that anxiety that's inside of them. If we don't look at the honest angle of, I'm going to use this word, which I don't think a lot of people are going to like, but I mean it in a different context, which is personal responsibility. When we realize that we're part of the problem, we realize that we're also part of the solution. And when we see that there's something that we get, there's something that we get when we obsessively worry, what is that thing that we get in return? Because we wouldn't do it if it wasn't something that tapped into some reward center in the body. That, that seems like a very difficult thing for a lot of people to explore on their own. Do you have any tips on navigating that? Or do you recommend that people do that with you know, a trained practitioner sort of unwinding how often maybe it's even deep childhood behaviors uh, have been linked into these patterns that they deem to be unfavorable? Yes. So it certainly can be helpful to have a coach or a therapist or somebody trained to kind of coach us through these processes. It's really important that they understand how these processes work for them to be, for the coach to be effective, because this isn't about going and exploring our entire childhood and, you know, and figuring out what it was, our relationship to our parents or whatever. As a psychiatrist, I'm not saying that stuff's bunk, but what I am saying when it comes to changing behavior, behavior is happening now. What happened in the past is in the past. It's not something that we can change. We can certainly recognize patterns. And ultimately, it comes down to, well, what's the pattern now? And what am I getting from it now? So some people can learn this from a book. They can read a book and get this. Some people, you know, that's why we have this app as well. That Some people can use that. Some people find that there's a therapist that's really good at really helping people see habit patterns in their lives uh, and that can be very helpful for folks as well. So I would say it really depends on somebody's proclivities and what they're, you know, what what works best for them. For some people, it's really just that simple question: What am I getting from this? And dropping into their direct experience, and trusting that even though it might feel uncomfortable, being able to see these patterns very clearly is going to help them be able to step out of them. And I'd have to say, given a choice, I'd rather see the pattern now. Then 10 years from now, when I've perpetuated it for 10 more years. You know, technology often gets a bad rap and we should have a healthy critical lens at, especially I would say ad-based technology that is trying to play off of what is often like the lowest common denominator of the human experience, right? What's the craziest shit I can show you right now that your brain will just cannot look away from? Um, and, and so that is a lot of, you know, modern social media. Um, but there's also so many incredibly beautiful things about technology like your app and other sort of solutions where let's be real, the healthcare system has gone through a lot. And we can also see that we do have a mental health crisis and anxiety is part of that. And we don't even sometimes have enough coverage between insurance and, and practitioners to really be able to give people the help that they need. So we need solutions at different sorts of stages to meet people where they're at. And that's why I always want to make sure that, yes, there are things about technology that are not great, but there's also things that are beautiful, like us being able to do this and also your app. So just because we've mentioned it a couple of times, I would love you to just walk us through that process. If somebody was going to use this app to unwind their anxiety, take us through the flow and the experience. Yeah. So it's basically 30 core modules. And the way I set it up as a, as a clinician, I want to make somebody make sure somebody actually uses it <laughs> as compared to, you know, okay, here's, here's a great gym, but nobody's going to go in the front door because it's too, you know, they have to drive too far to get there. So it's, it's basically 10 minutes a day of training where there are videos, animations in the moment exercises for people to kind of start to first, you know, understand, map out their habit loops. Second, see how unrewarding the old behavior is, typically you know, worry or whatever. And then third, learn some practices to step out of the habit loop. So 30 core modules, uh, in the moment exercises, daily practices that they can do. There are some check-ins that they can do that they can set to randomly ping throughout the day to have them do a short moment of mindfulness where they can start to tap into this. 
Then there are these theme weeks that people can use to dive more deeply into some of these solutions. So for example, we have uh, two full, two separate theme weeks on curiosity, because I think of curiosity as a superpower that can help people step out of these habit loops. We have a theme week on loving kindness because there are a lot of self-judgmental habit loops around anxiety and worry and procrastination. And so we can provide specific antidotes for those, but these practices sometimes can be challenging for people to get started. So we have specific ways to make sure people are getting those. And then also as part of the app, I, we have an online community that I moderate. I try to go on there every day and answer questions if folks have them in the Ask the Experts uh, forum. But we also have a weekly live group via Zoom where anybody using the app from anywhere in the world can join us. And I'll answer questions. We'll go over topics that people have questions about, about basically anything related to mindfulness and, and a habit. So we'll talk about, certainly talk a lot about anxiety, worry, eating, smoking, but we'll also get into things, you know, like procrastination and, and other topics uh, related to anything that, that ails people. So we really bring that package together where people can have this didactic training, uh, they can have an online community, and they can also have a live experience. And, and the aim is, God forbid, to help some people. And I say that uh, it's so fun every week to go on this group. We've been, I've been co-leading this group with two wonderful women, uh, this psychologist, Robin Baudet, and this, this woman, uh, Jackie Barnett in the UK. So we've been doing this for years. And I have to say that is one part of the week that I look forward to because I never know who's going to show up. We have several hundred people show up at a time and never know what questions are, but it keeps us on our toes. And I feel like we're constantly learning. And at the same time, it's great to see the progress that people are making in the program when they talk about their experiences as well. So that's, that's the program in a nutshell. Yeah, that's great. I love the community element of it. I was watching this uh, YouTube documentary um, on, the, on, on AA and just, you know, the history of AA and how it worked. And we've had some of the researchers at Mass General on the podcast previously talking about their studies on AA. And, you know, there was a lot of skepticism of did this thing work? And they were able to show that it works pretty well and that it's a, it's a great intervention. But one of the findings that came from that, that they highlight in the documentary is that um, the community piece is a major part of it because it tends to be that as everybody knows that our peer group and our, our surroundings tend to perpetuate certain behaviors if we're used to them. And uh, we can easily get ourselves back into an anxious loop when we are around other people who are also just trying to do their best to navigate all this, but might also have some anxious and worrying tendencies. But when you have, when you can pull away from that even a little bit, and I think digital communities can still be just as powerful as online communities, you start to surround yourself with people who are showing that they are that space between stimulus and response, that they're putting effort and energy into that awareness. And it's encouraging, you know, it's encouraging to share your story and it's encouraging to hear other people's stories and see that there's basically there's hope. If there's hope for somebody else that's on there and they're making a breakthrough, you also feel that there's hope for you too. Yeah. It, I'd like to highlight one element of, of communities that I really appreciate. And I think as a, as a really magic ingredient, it, this goes back to social contagion, right? So where we can catch vitriol or an outrage or fear from other people, we can also catch kindness as well. And my, my lab's actually done a study where we had people basically rank 14 different mental states so we could see which ones more, were more rewarding. And uniformly, people reported, this probably doesn't sound surprising, but we had to do the research to show it was true, that divisiveness, uh, anxiety, anger, things like that are less rewarding than connection and kindness and curiosity. And so in a, in a well-moderated online forum or community, you know, what it could be synchronous or asynchronous, you know, it could be a live group or just a, you know, online group where people are, are writing, you know, messages where there is curiosity, somebody asking, Oh, what's your experience? Like where there is kindness, where they're giving support saying, Oh, you know, I feel your pain, you know, um, hang in there or whatever there, that kindness starts to become contagious. And what I would suggest is it is because it's more rewarding, it is more contagious than vitriol and divisiveness. And that feeling of connection that comes through community, true support, 
you know, a place where people can feel you know, safe to, to share, you know, what's actually happening for them. That is gold. <laughs> that's the real, that's one of the golden elements of these communities is this social contagion of kindness. So, you know, somebody goes off the, off the community and they actually feel uplifted and then they pay that for where they're kinder to somebody in their family or in their neighborhood. And then that person feels uplifted and then, you know, boom, boom, boom. Imagine if we had, you know, kindness go viral as much as, you know, some of these fake news and vitriol things do. Ah, it's so true. I want to conclude on um, a topic which, uh, you know, a lot of people listen to our podcast and sometimes I get messages that people will, and I can usually say when they screenshot me and they put it on Instagram, I can see how far away along they've been listening through. So sometimes people will be in the middle and they'll send me a DM or they'll send me a screenshot. And it's like, this sounds amazing. And like, I love this information, but you don't understand. Like I just am this way. I just am. And then fill in the blank. I just am an anxious person. I just am. So for anybody, uh, Dr. Brewer, that's in that camp, that is um, feeling like they just are a particular way, and maybe they don't even really see a sense of hope for them. What, what's the lasting message that you want to leave for them with your work, with your book, with, with everything that you're up to? For them, I would say, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned this because somebody wrote me an email specifically like this, where she said, I feel like anxiety is deeply etched in my bones. That's how she put it, deep etched in my bones, anxiety. That's how identified she was with her anxiety. I actually wrote an entire module for our Unwinding Anxiety app specifically based on that because I thought that that idea was one, so pervasive and two, so important to address. So here, I'll come back to my patient, actually, the one that was referred to me for anxiety who went on to lose 100 pounds. How do you do with this anxiety? You know, this guy had panic disorder, had generalized anxiety disorder. I saw him one day, I was walking out of class. Uh, so Brown, the School of Public Health is on Main Street. And this guy drives up uh, um, and rolls down his window. It's my patient. And I'm looking at him because he's driving a car. You know, this guy with panic just started driving. And he says, oh, yeah, I'm an Uber driver now. I'm on my way to the airport to pick somebody up. Now, this guy was so identified with his anxiety that when he started letting go of it, this is maybe six, eight months into treatment. He came to my office one day and said, you know, it feels really strange when I'm not anxious and I'm starting to feel like I'm anxious for not being anxious, like there's something wrong. And so the thing I want to leave for everybody here is that even if something is so pervasive that you've had it for 20 or 30 years where you don't even know what it's like not to have it, there's something really important to know, which is when you step out of an old habit it is going to feel uncomfortable. And that discomfort does not mean danger. So when you do check in with yourself, ask, is there danger here? And see if you can move instead of into like a panic zone, move into your growth zone. Instead of going, oh no, there's something wrong. Go, oh, this is different. This is what my patient was doing. Oh, I'm not anxious. And it took him a little while to live into that space of being anxiety free. And then that was comfortable. And he was kind of over that hump of, of discomfort just because it was uncertain. Oh, he could be certain that he could be okay being calm. And then of course, he's, he's done extremely well. I just spoke with him, I think a couple of days ago at, in my clinic. And he says, I basically have no anxiety anymore. And he's actually so excited about learning how his own mind works that he is now coaching others and helping them to see how their own minds work because he's lived it. I mean, this guy lost over a hundred pounds. His anxiety has gone from a gazillion to close to zero and all of it through that awareness, but being willing to go into his growth zone. So that's what I would say. Be willing to lean in, be willing to be with discomfort, with uncertainty, because the only certain thing in life is uncertainty, but it doesn't mean that that's danger. It's a powerful message. And when you were sharing that, I was thinking about in the, you know, I'm from India and from the, the Jain, Jain and like the Hindu tradition yeah. and uh, also a student of Buddhism. And I think about, you know, in our modern culture, we think about the word karma and we often think about like, oh, karma is going to get you. That means if you do something bad to somebody, you, you know, it's going to happen back to you. And, yeah. and really like the deeper meaning of karma is like, 
identification with form. It's yeah. like unnecessary identification with form. Karma is, I think that I am a more valuable person because I drive a fancy car. Karma is, you know, I'm attached to this way of being because I feel like it's a protection mechanism. And I, I think about this gentleman that you're talking about, and it's almost like I see him just like shedding karma, shedding unnecessary attachment, you know, these rocks that he's carrying up the hill that he's like, what? I guess I just don't need to carry these rocks anymore. They're not helpful. I can understand why I was carrying them, but they're just not needed anymore. And my life and my health is going to be much better because of it. I, I love how you describe that. And it, you, I also think of karma having this cause and description of cause and effect, right? It can help us see when we're identified, there's the behavior. What's the effect? Oh, it's like carrying rocks up a hill. When I let go, there's the behavior. What's the effect? I feel much lighter. And so when we shed that, I love how you put that. When we shed that, there's cause and effect. That's karma in action. So true. Dr. Brewer, thank you so much for being on the podcast and sharing your wisdom. Your book is out and we have the links to all of it. The book, the app, Unwinding Anxiety, the new science shows how to break the cycles of worry and fear to heal your mind. And that's really the mission of this podcast is to let people know you're not broken, you can heal, and there are a ton of tools available. Thank you for dedicating your life to making those tools available for the public. And I am excited to check out the app and I hope that our community does as well too, in addition to the book. It's been a fantastic pleasure to have you on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed this as well.